Good morning, everyone. We're here on Monday, day after the Super Bowl, so I'm sure um, lots of people had too much to drink and partied too late and had a real good time and enjoyed themselves. I know I sure did all those things. Hope you all have a great week lined up ahead. There's all sorts of stuff happening this week for me, mainly because I have not a whole lot on my scheduled to-do list, which means sit in the office and work hard all day, every day. I like working hard all day, every day. I enjoy it. Good morning, Clint. Good morning, Louis Philippe. Good morning, everyone else who is here. I saw we're starting to get more viewers on this um, show with a little coffee, so that's great. A few weeks ago, we were getting about eight people. Now we're getting about 8,000, so that's good. We're ramping up. We're doing it. Hello to everyone here. All right, today, this morning, right before I started this, I was finishing up making some pre-flop charts for everyone. These aren't available for all of you yet, but they will be available soon enough. And today I wanted to talk about the limitations of charts. A lot of people think they can download some charts, follow the charts, and they'll just crush it, right? And um, that cannot be farther from the truth. The only charts, in theory, that you could blindly follow and crush it with are Game Theory Optimal-based charts. The problem, though, big, big problem, is that we don't know what Game Theory Optimal Poker looks like yet. You may be saying, well, I've seen charts showing all these Game Theory Optimal strategies. Yes, but you have to understand that you have to apply limitations to make the Game Theory Optimal charts. For example, a push-fold chart, right? I have a push-fold program that you can download, FTT Poker, or Float the Turn Poker. You can find it in the app stores. But what's the problem with the push-fold chart? It's right there in the name. You can only push or fold. You have two options. In real poker, you don't have two options. You have a lot of options. You can limp, you can min-raise, you can make it 2.3 big blinds, you can make it 2.6 big blinds, you can make it 3.5 big blinds, make it 8 big blinds, etc., etc., etc. So, all the charts that all of you are seeing are not actually Game Theory Optimal charts. They are simplified charts, right? They limit the number of options. So, what does that mean? Well, it essentially means charts are only useful for situations where either the options are very limited or you, the um, person taking in the content, has to be able to figure out how to adjust the charts based on your specific situation. So um, let's talk about push fold charts first, okay? Well, actually, no, let's go back to the, the first topic of um, what does an actual GTO chart look like? You're going to find that very often it's going to have many, many raise sizes available, right? You're going to find that, let's just say pre-flop with 40 big blinds, let's just say. There may be a situation where you are making it two big blinds with some hands, 2.3 big blinds with some hands, 2.6 big blinds with some hands, and then there are hands where you make it 2.6 big blinds 18% of the time, two big blinds 24% of the time, limp 2% of the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They become very unwieldy and not practical. That is why... All of us mere humans are never going to be able to develop a set of charts that you can blindly follow, okay? So knowing that, we can't develop a set of charts we can blindly follow. Please, please, please understand that point. Do not download my push fold chart and say, I used it on the bubble of a tournament I got broke. Was that bad? That's what someone emailed me yesterday. I said, well, did you read the instructions? No, I didn't read the instructions. Why do I need to read the instructions? Instructions say, not useful for bubble scenarios. Because it's not. It's just straight up wrong as all charts will be, because on a bubble scenario, there are many, many scenarios on the bubble, right? Sometimes you're going to be the big stack pushing around. Sometimes you're going to be the medium stack or the small stack. Sometimes you're going to be just trying to outlast somebody else who has a tiny stack, right? So the idea of I'm going to follow this chart in all situations is asinine, and you're going to lose a lot of money if you do that. Okay, now, now that we know that if you use charts wrong, you're going to lose a lot of money. Let's talk about the two most obvious push fold, or two most obvious sets of charts. Those are going to be push fold charts and uh, preflop charts across the board. I see a few other people promoting these things, selling these things on the internet. I give all of them away for free because I think this is not actually cutting edge information, right? This, is, this should all be free stuff. So push fold charts. You can get my app completely for free at, um, on the internet. You can go or on the, on the app stores, search float the turn poker. We're probably going to change this name in the near future, but check that out. And when are these charts useful? 
in general, from early position with 10 big blinds or shorter, when your 10 big blinds are shorter, using a push fold chart is probably going to be ideal. And that's because you can't really min raise and then fold in that, in that situation. D. Nelson says you like having a general idea of what to do. But again, on a bubble, using push fold chart, even looking at it, consulting it will be awful. Not just bad, awful. For example, this guy sent me a situation. He had 11 big blinds on the bubble. With 21 players left, 20 got paid. He had a seven offsuit. Push fold chart says easy shove, right? Duh. Um, should he shove there? And the answer is, I don't know. Is 11 big blinds a lot? Is it a little? Is there a two big blind stack sitting around who is obviously going broke next? Are you the shallow stack? Does everybody else have 50 big blinds? You know what I mean? Like looking at that, in all the situations I just listed, A7 is an easy shove or an easy fold. It's not even close. And thinking I can look at this and have a rough idea is not how it works. So you have to understand the limitations, right? And a lot of people simply don't. All right. Um, okay, so when are push fold charts useful? Well, first things first, make sure the push fold chart you're looking at is accurate. Sometimes people make little mistakes in their charts. There's a very popular push fold app out there that um, has spent a lot of money on marketing that is completely wrong. They charge you money for this app and they're giving you wrong advice. I'm not going to be outing any of them, but just be aware of that. Make sure you're getting your information from a reliable source. And also, it's easy to check this stuff. Download Hold'em Resources Calculator. Run the situation yourself. See if you get the same answer. If you get the same answer, you're good to go. Um, okay. 10 big blinds or less from early position. Push fold charts are pretty good. 12 big blinds or less from late position. Push fold charts are pretty good. As you get any deeper than that, it's not ideal. When Even when you're playing under the gun, like 11 big blinds, you're supposed to have a min raise and fold strategy. Sounds crazy, I know, but you're supposed to. What are we talking about today? The limitations of charts. What's a push fold chart? A chart you look at and tells you you should either go all in or fold with a shallow stack. All right, let's see. Um, you should essentially never um, use a push or fold strategy only from early position whenever you have 10 ish big blinds or more. And that's because you're shoving too many big blinds into lots and lots of people. Also, the ante is relevant, right? Make sure your charts that you're looking at takes the ante into account. Now, they threw another wrinkle at us, um, the big blind ante. Doesn't really change anything when you're playing medium or deep stack, but when you're playing very shallow stack, you should actually be jamming more often from early position. And that's because you lose a big blind whenever you're in the uh, big blind, for, you pay the ante, right? So, None of the push fold charts are accurate anymore, which is really, really fun. And as far as I know, no one has solved this yet. It requires future game simulations. Talk about a future game simulation. Here, we have a future game simulation. Mr. Thomas, oh, he just woke up. We're gonna see how this future game happens. We see how I turned out. We're gonna get to see how Mr. James turns out and Mr. Thomas turns out, both of them. I bet they're going to be slightly different. Maybe they'll be the same. Maybe they'll be different. Here's Mr. Thomas. He is, how old are you today? Are you seven weeks old yet? Are you seven weeks old yet? Wednesday. And Wednesday is going to be seven weeks old. Can you say hi? Here, I hold you up. Like Rafiki. The circle of life. Okay, bye. Thank you, Amy. We hear Mr. James out there. Okay. How many big blinds should we start shoving then? Dean Nelson, I just told you, I specifically just told you, 10 big blinds are shallower from early position, 13 big blinds are shallower, 12 big blinds are shallower from late position. <sighs> okay, let's see. Use the push fold chart, the float to turn push fold chart, it's a no brainer. Yes, I try to make it a no brainer because I put out accurate information and it's free instead of putting out inaccurate information and charging for it. That's just a no brainer, right? All right. Um, basically it for push fold charts. Also, a lot of people use push fold charts from the small blind, which is often particularly bad. Um, very often from the small blind, you're going to want to be using a pretty wide limping strategy, and that's because you're usually getting very, very good odds. Oh, um, sorry, going back to future game simulations. Uh, whenever you fold, now that there's a big blind ante, which is very, very relevant, whenever, like let's say you have four big blinds, right, under the gun, you should still be pretty tight with a normal ante or no ante. But with a big blind ante, you just lose 
25% of your stack on the next hand is just gone. It just goes to the ante. It vanishes. And that is really detrimental. So you really, really, really want to have 8 or 10 big blinds when you're taking the big blind. If you have less than that, it becomes really, really harsh. So you should be jamming wider from early position. No one solved this yet. I um, One of the players who developed the Heads Up bot that beat all the best Heads Up players, I asked him to look into it, and he's like, oh, it's a mess. <laughs> so it's a mess. All we're going to do is estimate, and that's fine. It's good. I like the idea that... Um, you know, it's, it's hard to solve these situations. Okay, so push fold charts. Now you know when to use them. Now you know when not to use them, more importantly. Um, also, push fold charts will very often have calling ranges. Okay? Calling ranges assume the opponent is using the push fold strategy. Okay? But, did you listen to what I just told you? Push fold strategy is not optimal most of the time. So, imagine it folds to the small blind, and they have 12 big blinds, and they shove. Should you call with the range that a push fold chart tells you to call with? Think a second. Think about this. We don't know who the small blind is. Let's actually assume he's good. <laughs> if he's good, you definitely don't want to call like a push fold chart tells you, because you're going to be calling off way too wide. And that's because push fold charts assume the opponent's using the push fold strategy. But I just told you small blinds should be limping a lot, right? Which means their shoving range is going to be way more polarized. It's a very good hands and hands that are not. Actually, let me think about this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Their chart, their range is going to be the a lot of um, strong medium strength stuff for the most part. They're going to be limping to some of their best hands and limping a lot of the marginal stuff. They're jamming the decent stuff in the middle. They're not just jamming everything. Even I get confused sometimes. When I'm talking about this stuff. So what happens when we wing it? Um, for those who don't know, I wing almost all my videos. One take only. We don't have time to have lots and lots of takes. It takes a lot of time to make lots and lots of takes. Um, so, in that scenario, you should be calling off much tighter than if the opponent is using a shove or fold strategy because they're not using the same strategy you are assuming. You can certainly develop a game theory optimal strategy based on what you think their strategy is, but if you look at a push fold chart and use those push fold chart calling ranges, you're going to um, lose a lot of money. Also, again, going back, trying to help out the other paid application out there, they um, have completely wrong calling ranges. So don't listen to that. They have you calling off way, 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 way too wide. Let's see. How few big blinds should we be in a push fold as opposed to limping? Back, I, I just explained this, and I don't think you listened. Oh, you're referring from the small blind. So from the small blind... Um, 10 is fine, 8 is fine, it's fine to limp in these scenarios. You have to understand, what when you limp, you're getting amazing pot odds, and if the opponent jams too wide, what happens? I mean, I want to make it clear, you're limping with your aces, you're limping with your kings, you're limping with your queens and jacks and ace-king and ace-queen. You're slow playing. If you limp and they jam 100% of the time, they're going to get slaughtered. It's not even going to be fair, because they're jamming too often, right? You have to make sure you're developing a fundamentally sound strategy. I'm not saying limp all of your garbage. Right? I'm saying limp a balanced range. It's important to balance your range. All right, let's see. Now we're going to go to preflop raising charts. Another uh, popular training set out there is a lot of preflop raising charts with no real explanation. And um, first things first, you need to adjust. The side I'm thinking of has three different charts that are all just kind of all over the place. And... I know for a fact people are out there downloading charts and using them mindlessly. They're opening with the ranges they say, they're three betting with the ranges they say, they're calling three bets with the ranges they say, and the people using these charts are lighting their money on fire. Now, to be fair, it may be better than uh, what complete novices would do, and you know, maybe that is it, maybe that's the answer, is that charts are really good for novices. That could be that actually the, um, the right answer to all this, is I am, I am looking at this from a strong poker player point of view, where I understand no set of easy charts is going to solve your problems. Um, but it, it is a starting point, right? I was actually writing instructions for my preflop charts I have coming out soon. And first thing and last thing I say is these are only starting points. Please adjust significantly. If you do not, if you sit back and you play default poker all the time, well, you're going to be roughly a default player and you are going to break even, or lose a little bit, or win a little bit. 
I am not trying to teach you all to break even or lose a little bit or win a little bit. I'm trying to teach you to win a lot of money. The way you make any significant money from poker is by having a very high return on investment or playing a ton, either one. Um, ideally both. <laughs> That's what I did. I played a lot with a high ROI. I want to teach you all to be good winning players, not sit around and break even. I mean, that, that's really, that's what you're going to do if you just sit down and you, you don't deviate from the charts. So, for example, um, looking at pre-flop raising charts, um, a good spot not to deviate is when you're in early position. Because from early position, you have to take your hand against all the other random hands at the table. Someone, somewhere, is going to wake up with something. And because of that, you can't just be mindlessly raising any two cards. Um, when should you be adjusting? Well... An obvious example, say you're in the big blind and we have a big blind defending range. What's that based on? Is it based on if there's an ante in play? Is it based on a min raise, a 2.5 big blind raise, three big blind raise, what? What if your opponent makes it 10 big blinds preflop? Well, following a chart when your opponent makes it 10 big blinds preflop is going to be lighting money on fire, right? Because the charts don't assume your opponents are making it so big, your pot odds are very relevant. So, it's a good spot not to use them. Um, small blind strategies are a great spot to, to not use preflop charts. Um, the, chart, the strategy I recommended is a pretty wide limping strategy. But even then, that can be very wrong. If your opponent folds too much in the big blind, you should just raise 100% of hands, right? If your opponent three bets every hand, you should limp a ton. Or you should raise a lot and then know you're going to be four betting a lot, right? So the idea of, I'm just going to sit here and follow this chart, is not ideal. Charts are a good place to start. They are a good way to get an idea of what you're supposed to do. As long as you even understand the situation. Like someone said earlier, I use the push-fold chart in tournaments to see what I should probably shove, then I adjust if I'm on the bubble or whatnot. But like I was saying, there's so many spots on the bubble where you should be jamming really wide or really nitty. And it doesn't even depend on your stack. <laughs> it depends on the other people's stacks. A lot of people don't even think, what do the other people at the table have? What do the people at the other table have, right? I mean, the situation that someone emailed me in, I have 11 big blinds on the bubble with 21 players left when you get paid. What if everyone at your table has 30 big blinds, but at the other table, everybody has four big blinds? Well, obviously, you just fold your A7, right? What if you have 11 big blinds, everybody else has 100? Well, then obviously, you're all in, right? So, in both scenarios, it's like, you have to be aware of not even what's happening exactly in front of you with your stack, but with everybody else's stack and everybody else's stack in the rest of the field. So that is very relevant. You saw Fedor Holtz limp with eight big blinds. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's just good poker. He has studied poker and knows how to play well. Great example. Watch what Fedor does, and um, that's probably somewhat close to right. All the best players roughly know what a solid, fundamentally sound strategy looks like, and they're also very, very good at adjusting from it. It's important to adjust from it. Pablo says, if your EV and hold manager is positive, does that mean that you are playing correctly? And it might not be the right indicator because of ICM? Um, I don't know exactly what you're asking, Pavlos. Winning chips is certainly not ideal in tournaments. You're trying to win equity. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Consult someone who's really good with those programs. I know how to get the information I need out of them. I don't know, like, I don't, I'm not so concerned with, I guess, short-term results is what it amounts to. But, Certainly, if you're, you want your dollar EV graph to be going up, right? I, I don't exactly know, know how it works with terms because I'm really not so concerned with that. But ask a pro at Hold a Manager. They have a website with a forum. Check that out. It's important to know what you're not the best at. I think a lot of people, a lot of talking heads out there, they um, want to act like they know everything. And I certainly don't know everything. I do know what I know. And for the longest time, you know, I didn't really say a whole lot in the poker world. I kept quiet. I listened. I observed. I learned. I studied. And if you are out there talking as an authority figure about something that you don't actually know, understand you are leading your audience astray. Now, a lot of people out there don't really care if they lead their audience astray because they think you all are they're just trying to make money off of all of you. And, you know, to be fair, I write books. I make training videos. I'd like to make some money here because it does take a lot of time and effort. But at the end of the day, I don't care if I make any money from this. This is free, right? My apps are free. The push bowl charts are free. The, uh, um, these preflop charts are going to be free. Everything I'm making here is free because I want to help all of you. I realize that if you put out a lot of beneficial things in the world, it'll all come back to you tenfold, maybe more. 
Let's make it a hundredfold for fun. And um, I want to help all of you, so I'm not trying to give you bad information. All right. Do I prefer cash or tournaments? I don't really care. I like to play poker. Is there a good limping strategy for sword stacks and positions other than the small blind? Miguel, optimal strategy from the button with 15 to 20 big blinds. Let's have a limp or shove strategy. Okay? Optimal strategy from the other positions, cut off in earlier, is to have a min raise or shove strategy or fold, obviously. Now, you may say, why should you min raise from cut off in earlier but limp from button? Take a second, figure it out. I'll give you the answer in a second. You lost 150 big blinds playing poker. 150 big blinds is not much. Every day when I used to play, I would win or lose 450 big blinds. And live poker, slow live poker. Is there any good content that teaches you how to exploit players using push fold charts? Um, well, just realize they're using a suboptimal strategy. But um, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything specifically out there based on that. Just call her, call her fold accordingly, right? What do you mean by trying to win equity and not chips? In a tournament, the goal is not to get all of the chips. The goal is to win money, right? Let's say on a bubble. Oh, hello. Hi. What do you want? Well, hi, you. you want to come see what's going on? Okay. Come here. You scared me. You, you about made me jump out of my skin, little man. Here's the other, the other future game simulation. Can you say hello to everybody? Hello. Are you having a good day? Good day. Oh yeah, good day. James decided to sleep on the floor. Again, why'd you sleep on the floor? Huh? Why didn't you call me? Huh? Can you say call me? Call me. Yeah, call me. Huh? It's daddy. Yeah. It's daddy. Daddy and daddy and daddy. Three daddies, that's right. Three daddies. <laughs> Three daddies. Three daddy. How many Jameses do you see? Right. One. Two. Three. Uh-huh. Four. Four? Okay, bye. Love you. Have fun. See you. So many, uh, so many guests today. Okay, what do you mean by winning equity, not winning the, uh, chips? And and tournaments, like let's say on the bubble, right? You shove that a seven offsuit, you will win chips for sure, right? But on the bubble, it's really really bad to shove there because if you get called and you lose and you're out, you're just out of the tournament. And that's really really bad. So that's a good example of a spot where you want to win uh, dollars, right? If you shove, you will win chips. But the goal is not to win chips, the goal is to win money. And folding in that spot wins money. How do you think ace, queen against ace, king in the 3-bet pot? Is that normal losing a bunch of money um, And when you hit an ace? Yeah, probably. If you play a 3-bet pot with ace, queen, and you get top pair, you're going to lose some money when they have ace, king. He's getting so big so fast. That's accurate. Okay, go back to that answer. Okay, whenever you limp the, or go to the question, when you limp the button, you know you're going to be in position throughout the hand, right? And again, when you're limping on the button, you have aces and kings in your range. You are slow playing the nut hands. And you're also limping with a wide range of hands that flop very well. You want to limp and then be able to call a raise and see a flop in position. And you may say, I'm going to limp and then call a three or four big blind raise? Yes, you are, out of your 15 big blind stack. So you are limping there because you know you're going to be in position. When you limp the cutoff, though, now the button gets to limp, and now you're not in position. Being in position is very, very, very important. So from the earlier positions, you want to be min-raising. From the button, you want to be limping. And to be fair, if you look at perfect GTO strategies, um, you should be limping some and min-raising some from both positions. All positions, really. But the difference in equity between a limp, min-raise, shove, or fold strategy and a limp, shove, or fold strategy is very, very minimal. It's like 0.01 big blinds per 100 hands or something like that. It's like pretty much nothing. So one strategy is definitely better. If you like plugged a perfect strategy into a robot, it would be doing both. But we're not robots. And again, I always try to teach strategies that are implementable, okay? Whenever I have these um, preflop charts coming out, they're not gonna say to open some hand half of the time or some of the time or anything like that. They're gonna say you just need to raise it. and a good example is, let's say you know you're supposed to 3-bet king 5, king 4, king 3, and king 2 offsuit 25% of the time. Let's just pretend. Well, instead of saying I'm going to do it 25% of the time, just pick one of them and do it all the time. It's not perfect, but it's implementable. Dean Elsa says, you're not worried about letting the big blind get a disguise 2 pair? No. Because I want to be able to limp with all sorts of stuff, right? 
you don't want to min raise and then have to if you see this D Nelson issue here is if you raise with whatever, let's say you raise with um eight seven suited and your opponent jams, you need to fold. But if you limp and your opponent raises, you can easily call, right? And that that goes for a lot of hands. Uh, shoving is like tiny tiny a tiny tiny bit profitable, but limping is going to be better because you'd rather not get it all in with eight seven suited pre flop. So um, what it amounts to is. You want to see flops in position. A lot of edge comes from that. Let's see. Best players are ahead of players using push fold charts. Well, of course, they're using a better strategy. As people use a better strategy, they're going to win more, more and more money. Um, what Jonathan information do you refer? Do I refer you to to improve your heads up game? I actually don't have a ton on heads up poker. I would tell you to check out Excelling at No Limit Holder. There's a chapter in there by Olivier Bousquet, one of the best heads-up players in the world. I um, went to his house every day and helped him write it. It was great. And um, I, I learned a lot from it, so I, I think that's definitely a good thing to do. It's not, it's not huge. It's like 25 or 30 pages, but it is good. You bought Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Holder, and in all these charts, you don't see that you're allowed to play 7-4 suited. Why not? Actually, you should play it every once in a while. Um, not too often, though. You'll be fine not playing your 7-4 suited. <sighs> that said, you know, if you look at these game theory optimal programs, again, very often it'll say, play 7-4 suited 10%, 8-5 suited 10%, 9-6 suited 10%, 9-5 suited 10%. So, if you, know, if you decide to play that 7-4 suited and not all the other suited junk, it's probably not so bad. Um... Yeah, back to pre-flop charts. Let's say an early position player raises, and you're playing what you think is pretty fundamentally sound. You should have some bluffs, right? But if you look at the generic under-the-gun raising range of most people today in small and medium stakes tournaments, it's just really, really strong. So if you know their range is dimes and better, ace-king and ace-queen, do you really want to be bluffing that guy? The answer is no. It'd be dumb to bluff that guy. So if you follow a game theory optimal chart in that scenario, you're just lighting money on fire with all of your bluffs. It's completely unnecessary. So that's the spot where you should definitely deviate from charts. Um, what if you are on the button and the players in the blinds are all really tight? Or what if you're on the hijack seat and the players on the button and the small cutoff and the small blind and the big blind are all really tight? Well, in that scenario, you should also be raising very, very wide, right? So the idea of I'm just going to download these charts and follow these charts blindly will cost you money in the long run. And like I said, if you play default poker, you're going to have default results. It's not very good. So be aware of that. Let's talk about some spots where you can play 7-4 suited. Um, one of the spots that I have learned over the last few years is that, say, people raise from middle position and you're in the big blind, some of the best hands to 3-bet are the low-suited connected hands, and your nut hands, of course. You 3-bet Jackson better, ace-king, maybe ace-queen, and then you 3-bet stuff like 7-4 suited, uh, six four suited, seven six suited, seven five suited, six five suited, six four suited, six three suited. You three bet all this low suited stuff. And you may ask, why are you three betting all this low suited stuff? Well, think about it for a second. It's intuitive. The reason is because when you three bet, the player who opened is very likely to call you, right? Because they're going to be in position. So you want to have either your best hands which dominate a lot of the medium strength hands, or you want to be well below their calling range. If they're calling with 10-9 and 9-8 and king-10 and stuff like that, well, you really don't want to have very many 10s and 9s in your range, right? But they're not calling you with any hands contain a 7 or a 6 or a 5 or a 4, so those cards are all very, very live. So there's a spot where you can 3-bet the 7-4 suited, right? As opposed to king-4 suited. That's the spot where you really don't want to have blockers. So if you look at a lot of fundamentally sound strategies, they have like one or two blocker hands. Like say, ace nine offsuit's not quite good enough to call. That's going to be a ace x blocker hand, and then also low suited connected stuff. So Dustin, there you go. If you want to play the seven four suited, three bet it from the big blind specifically. Will the Michael Acevedo book be out in March? No, it'll be out in June or July. Amazon's lying to you. Sorry. You want a ton of chips with 7-6 suited and off-suited. Good job. Oh, defending the big blind. Duh, you can just call the big blind too. I mean, that's the spot as well. So I have to take a note real quick. Very important to take notes when things pop into your head. Uh, where'd my notepad go? 
I have all sorts of microphones and devices. Sorry for having to look around everything. It would be sick if you open, raise, and seven four off with seven four offsuit the board game. Seven four four, but even then you might not get action. Um, yes, I mean clearly, anytime you raise with any two cards, if you flop a boat or quads, that's a good thing. Um, not a whole lot to say about that. Yes, you'd like quads to come, and you like boats to come. Kevin says, whenever you play the bad hands, you ran a bluff and you got there with the nuts on the river. That's one of the benefits of playing the low-suited connected stuff is that whenever you bet the flop, bet the turn, and bet the river, you just randomly have a flush or a straight or trips by the river. Tips for your World Series of Poker event. They're playing the $500 50th anniversary event. Ooh, I think I wrote an article about this, and I don't think you're going to like it. Let's see. What was it called? Um, the Monster Stack World Series of Poker Events. You can find it. Well, it's a bad URL, sorry. Um, just Google Jonathan Little Monster Stack World Series of Poker Events. And I don't know if this is going to directly apply, but I think this is the one where they give you a bunch of chips, right? If this is the one where you give, they give you a bunch of chips, um, it's quite bad for, for recreational players or for people who are new to the game. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum it up, essentially. What it amounts to is if you're playing a deep stack tournament against very good players, even if there aren't very many of them in the field, they will... Inevitably, the good players will final table a lot, and that's not going to be so good for you. Um, let's see. Whenever they had the first monster stack tournament, six out of the nine players at the final table were essentially pros, like good pros, and three out of the nine were not. They like had no results. So what does that mean? That means of all the players with no results who played that tournament, I don't know how many people played it, but it was a lot. Let's say 10,000. Let's say um, 8,000 of them had no results, or 5,000 of them had no results. Proportionally, they did quite poorly, right? So I don't know anything about the player who just asked this question, but events where, they, where you are very, very deep stacked are qu quite bad for the recreational players. So if I was going to the World Series of Poker and I wanted to gamble, I would play the turbo tournaments if I thought I was not as good as the opponents, like if I was a relatively recreational player. Now, of course, you have to get your experience somewhere. You have to get started somewhere, right? So I understand the idea of getting in there and playing and trying to make it happen. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a relatively skill-intensive format, like the main event, right? Look at the main event of the World Series of Poker. You see every year, half the field is recreational players, and the final table is like 10% or 20% recreational players. And why is that? Well, because it's actually a very skill-intensive format. Okay, let's see. In your bar game, okay, we're, everyone likes to talk about playing bad cards because it's fun and sexy. Actually, it's just silly and dumb in my mind. All right. Whenever you play only one table at a time, you cash more often. Yeah, it's because you're paying attention, right? What kind of strategy you use for three betting from the big blind in tournaments? I just outlined it. Three bet the best hands, then the low suited connected stuff. Yeah, Lewis, um, World Poker Tour events are a decent example of this. Not necessarily the best example, but um, in the past, they used to be really good examples. If you looked at World Poker Tour tournaments of the past, they would start you off pretty deep stacked. They'd have a super, super slow structure, and every final table would be almost all pros. They changed that, though. Um, over the last, I don't know, five or ten years, now the buy-ins are a little bit lower, so they're proportionally more recreational players, which is fine. But they sped up the tournaments a lot. I mean, they used to have two-hour blind levels in a lot of World Poker Tour tournaments. Now they have 40, huh, right? So the tournament lasts two-thirds as long, or 66% you know, as long, or something like that. And when you make the tournament way, way faster, what happens is there's less skill involved, right? And this is why you see fewer players having relatively consistent results. Also, the fields are bigger, so you should you should have fewer consistent results, or less consistent results. That said, some, I know every time I say this, people say, but look at so-and-so, they've been crushing it. Variance does happen. Some people are going to run hot all the time. Everyone loves looking at corner cases and saying that because this corner case exists, your statement must be false. And that's just ridiculous, right? Um, everyone's going to run hot sometimes. Someone's going to run hot every year. I mean, 
Just look. Look at the results every year. There's always someone who plays, wins every tournament they play, and then everyone says, oh my god, are they the best ever? The answer is, they're certainly good, but they're just getting hit with the good side of variance. No one really looks at all the players who are very good, but have really bad results. And are they bad? No, they're just not winning all their hands. Winter satellites, a good or a bad idea? We've discussed this plenty. I'm sure you can Google Jonathan Little satellites and it'll come right up. Basically, as you're more and more recreational, as you're looking to have, win a trip, have a good experience, go somewhere, play a big tournament, have a chance to get rich, that's when satellites are good. When you're using satellites to try to grind up a bankroll slowly, well, satellites are quite bad because now, instead of cashing one out of eight tournaments, you're only going to cash one out of 64, or maybe less, right? Because you have to win the satellite, then you have to win the other tournament, or cash the satellite, then cash the other tournament. It's a parlay, right? So when are parlays good? Parlays are good when you're trying to get rich quick. Parlays are awful when you're trying to have a long, sustainable career. Mr. James is outside cleaning. He's a good worker. You want a $20 Turbo Series ticket? You're quite excited to play. Well, good. Get in there. Run hot. I think a lot of people don't... Um... Whenever you make any decision in life, whatever it is, any decision, always ask, what does this decision imply? Right? When you, um, well, when you play a satellite, what does that imply? That implies I'm going to give up the future long-term potential of being a professional in exchange for a tiny chance to get rich and then go from there. Whenever you play a tournament instead of cash games, what does that imply? That implies, again, you're happy to accept variance in exchange for what? Maybe prestige, maybe a chance to get rich quick. Um, whenever you play cash games instead of tournaments, what does that imply? That implies you don't care about prestige. You don't care about um, the chance to get rich quick and instead you're happy to just have a slow, steady grind. And all these things are relevant, right? Whenever you open that 7-4 suited from early position, what does that imply? That implies you don't care about winning money. You're happy to be a losing player as long as you get to see flops, right? Is it okay to play satellites if you're buying it anyway? Ordinary man, okay is irrelevant. I think this is the thing a lot of people don't understand. Is like, it doesn't matter what you do. Do whatever you want to do, but understand the consequences of whatever you do. Um, I will say that I play satellites. A great example of this is the World Poker Tour tournament at Ari I took sixth place in last year, where the day before the tournament, actually two days before the tournament, I was playing a 5K or something, and I looked around, there was some other tournament going on on the side. I'm like, huh, what's that? It was a $200 satellite into the $1,000 satellite the next day. Okay, I observed this. The next day was an off day. There was nothing going on. Literally no tournaments in Vegas, $1,000 or higher, except for a $1,000 satellite. Now, I knew I was going to play the 10K anyway, and I also knew there were at least going to be some bad players in there because they were all grinding out this $200 term. I didn't know any of them, clearly. And so I knew there were going to be people who satellite into the satellite, so the tournament's going to be soft, and there's no other game to play. Well, that's a good example of a spot where I should probably play, right? Um, so I did want to see, and then um, they could say I'm, I'm the satellite winner. Jonathan Little, the satellite winner, who made the final table. Turned $1,000 into hundred something K. Oh my goodness. All right. But um, that's a good example of when to play them if, is if the buy-in is still quite high, right? Like say I want my average buy-in to be $5,000. Well, a thousand is still within reason. I'm not going to play a $200 satellite because like that same day, like I said, there was a 5K. Would I rather play a 200 or a 5K that I want to be playing anyway? So safe to assume that the live tournaments have faster levels that more recreational players have a better chance. Yes. As the tournament structure is worse, return on investments get closer to losing the rake. Everyone's does. If you're a losing player, you'll lose less. If you're a winning player, you'll win less. So we all pay the rake. That's the problem with turbo tournaments, though, is that everybody pays the rake. It's well known on um, the major poker site out there that you don't want to play turbo tournaments because the highest ROI you're going to have is like 10%, maybe 15%. And that's not worth it for a lot of people. How big of an ROI do you need to have in satellites for them to be worth it? Again, Thomas, bad question. What does worth it mean? What if you want to win your trip to the Bahamas to go to play a tournament there? I mean, what's a trip worth to you? You may never get to take a trip, right? If you've never get, gotten to take a trip, getting a trip to the Bahamas to go play poker and maybe win life-changing money is worth a ton. So it's not just all about the money.
And then if, if you are asking a straight return on investment question, just do the math. I mean, think about this, Thomas. If you have 10% ROI in the, in the satellite and then 10% ROI in the main tournament when you get in there, well, you're making money, right? You're gonna have infinite variance, but you're making money. But if you're properly bankrolled, you don't care about variance. If you have the thousand buy-ins or whatever it is you need to play satellites long-term, because you just like never cash for a big amount, right? Think about this. If you cash a satellite one in eight times, which is a good win rate, right? You're supposed to be one in 10, you're one in eight. Then the main event, let's say you're satellite into 500 player tournaments and you win it. Well, let's just say you break even in there. That means one in eight times you cash the main event and then one in eight times you cash the satellites so or one in 64 to get any money back. So that means they're gonna go on, what? 300 buy-in downswings regularly, give or take, because that does happen. Then also, whenever you do cash, it's often not gonna be for a ton. So how often do you actually win the tournament? Well, you're one in 500 times one in eight. That's uh, what? one in 4,000 you win the tournament. It's a lot of tournaments. <laughs> so it's just like super high variance poker and it's okay to play super high variance poker. Would I say deep stack tournaments and cash games are similar to each other? They should be, but often people don't know how to play, well, either, either game very well. But yes, they're similar enough. You should be playing more cash games or tournaments while you're learning. You should be playing tiny stakes while you're learning. You do not need to play big stakes. Don't think you need to play for lots of money. It's not a good idea. Where am I located? New York City. What site do I prefer to play online? I like to play on Party Poker and Poker Stars. I don't play in New York, though, because you can't play on either of those. Luckily, I get to travel some. I go out of the country and I play there. How do you plan your day with online sessions. I just, like I just said, I don't play online. In my daily routine, I wake up and do a little coffee for you half the time. <laughs> um, listen, my routine is wake up, hang out with my family, do some work, go to bed. That's my day. Have I played any Magic the Gathering? Yes, I play Magic online a decent amount. I went to, I've been doing very well with Grixis, Delver, and Legacy. It's quite a good deck. Um, and I played the other day in Grand, P Grand P, New Jersey. Won two, lost one, and the one I lost, he had it all. Sometimes they're gonna have it all. If you wanna go to a big live tournament and win a bracelet, where should you start? Well, I just told you, if you don't have a lot of experience, and if you're asking me this question, you should play the Turbo Tournaments at the World Series of Poker. Those have lots of variance. High variance gives anyone a really good chance to win. Isn't it possible to play over a VPN? There's a saying, you don't um, crap where you eat. Everyone knows this. Don't be a fool. Don't do shady things. I have definitely done shady things in my past and I learned that was a very, very bad, bad, bad decision. Don't do shady things. Don't do anything out of line. Don't think, I'm just gonna skirt the law or skirt, skirt the uh, rules of the sites. That is very short-sighted and silly. Don't do that. Do the right thing. Is it worth it to play sit and goes? Again, what does worth it mean? Please, everyone out here, someone out here, explain to me what worth it means. Is there a casino I would suggest on the East Coast? I like the Borgata. Borgata's good, that's in New Jersey. I like the Hard Rock in Florida, that's in Fort Lauderdale. Um, yes, Anton, you may get banned. That's the issue, you may get banned and they may take your money. And also, like, why do you need to do shady things? Don't do shady things. <laughs> Denti, Denti sums it up. The worth it means, will I become a millionaire by tomorrow if I do it? Yes, I agree. What is, but yeah, like what is, is it worth it to do something? If your time is worth $0, then it's worth it for you to do anything. If you have a job making 400K a year, no, you shouldn't be playing $5 sit and goes unless you're doing it for fun. Natty says, he reaffirms no uh, crappy things. Would you ever consider streaming magic? I have in the past. It's, not, it's not enjoyable for me. Worth it means have the JL stamp of approval. Again, I don't know this guy's situation. He's He hasn't presented anything to me, right? Is it worth it to play sit and goes? I don't know. Get, what, what are you doing? What else are you doing with your life? You have a hard time putting people on ranges. Read Mastering Small Six Millimum and Hold'em and sign up for your completely free trial of PokerCoaching.com. Go through the quizzes, go through the homework, and you'll be very good at pe putting people on ranges. National Harbor is a good place. I've never been there, but I hear it's great as well. You have a residency outside of USA. Yes. In order to sign up on Stars, Party Poker, et cetera, et cetera, you need to have a residency outside of America. You do not, being a citizen is irrelevant. You have to have a residency. I suggest you check out um, Poker Refugees. They can relocate you. Kevin says, worth it means what you are getting from it is experience. 
I mean, listen. Definitely there's value in getting experience playing sit and goes. Right? Sit and goes are great because they're like a final table. A lot of the best sit and go players in the world have gone on to be some of the best poker players in the world, best tournament players at least. And that's because they understand structures, right? So certainly it is relevant to get that experience. And I think sit-and-goes are a good way to build a bankroll because you get to play a ton of games, get a lot of experience quickly. That said, don't expect to be very profitable once you get above like the $20 games. How do you play Ace-King on an 8-6-2 board as a pre-flop raiser? Jimbo, that is an awful question. Awful, awful, awful question. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes to see all the information you are missing. Kevin says, poker coaching is the best side bar none. Well, thank you. Can playing a super tight style work these days? No. It's happened a long time ago with this book. Um, somebody wrote something on Hold'em. What was the guy's name? Yeah, remember that Remember that book? The old, the old book that sold lots of copies that made everybody a weak tight knit. That one. Um, that's a good way to blind out. You don't want to blind out. If you play too tight, you're going to blind out and you're not going to win tournaments. It might be a good strategy in cash games where nobody cares what you're doing, right? If nobody cares what you're doing, then it may be okay to play really, really nitty. The problem, though, is that people are aware that if you don't put a chip in the pot, well, you're probably a nit. And if you're probably a nit, don't pay people off. If, if they think you're a nit, they're not going to pay you off. I think I said that wrong. Whenever I get reading a, a comment, I... um. My brain, my brain stops. My brain stops working for a second. It was cool seeing me on TV. It was a replay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Glad you're enjoying it. Yes, everyone named the book. The book that teaches people to be weak and tight. It's a great place to learn. Listen, ideally, if you are just awful, like if, if you are someone who plays literally every hand or you're someone who plays literally no hands, if you're terrible, basic books like that are really, really good for you because they're going to get you playing not so bad. You're going to go from being a big loser to just a small loser. But again, I say this in my first book I wrote, gosh, eight, nine, eight years ago now. My goal is not to make you a small loser or a small winner. I'm not trying to make small winners here. I'm trying to make big winners. Just last month, interestingly enough, we had... Um, Someone else cashed for 200K in a live tournament, which is good. You know, they're winning winning circuit events, stuff like that. We had Scarmaker took third place in the party poker tournament. Talk about a satellite player. Turned $5 into $1.3 million. He loves all my stuff. Now we're working together a bit more, which is great. And um, I'm trying to make big winners here. I'm not trying to make winners who win no money. Or, you know, I don't want you all to sit here and pass your time playing poker and you're going to look back 10 years later and say, man, what was I doing? I'm trying to have... People play poker. Ten years later, look back and say, oh, now I have a million dollars. That's good. And, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So do please do not be confused and think that I'm trying to make you all break even. It's not what we're trying to do here. What do you think about the new poker site by Phil Goffon? I don't know anything about it. It's not available for Americans, so I'm not so interested. Um, you have to understand, there's a lot, a lot in poker news and poker media and the poker world going on all the time. And... I don't really care about most of it. And if someone's opening a poker site that's not available to Americans, if I'm not an investor in it, I'm not that worried about it. Just because it's not, it doesn't matter for me. I, I like Phil Galfond and I hope whatever he does succeeds. That said, I have not been involved in the least bit, so it's just not on my radar. But I imagine he's going to try to do something good for the poker community, and um, I, I definitely suggest everyone support it. If you can, right? If you're an American, you can't support it. Well, then you can't, you can't do anything. Sit here and enjoy yourself. Sometimes you win pots with nothing, as you should. You spend so many hours on YouTube watching lots of content. You'd like to say hi if you're ever at a casino. Do I mind when my fans come meet me? No, whenever I go to play live poker series, I try to have breakfast for my fans. In Montreal recently, Louis Philippe was there. He brought a few friends. A bunch of other people came and... We had breakfast. I mean, that's the kind of thing I do. I want to say hi to everyone. I want to let everyone have a good time and a good, good experience. One thing I think is lacking from poker is that um, currently a lot of the online sites have pros who don't really do anything. And I don't understand why a site would sponsor a pro if they don't really do anything. 
beyond play exactly poker? I mean, like if I was a pro for a site, you can bet your rump. I would be out there having meet and greets, having free poker classes, going and, you know, having breakfast like I, like I do already for you all anyway. And I don't understand why people, like in my mind, they just don't do a good work or they just don't care that much. And it's sad to me because like, I know whenever I was coming up as a poker pro, like how cool it would have been, would have been if like Phil Ivey was having a breakfast and you could just go and sit and have breakfast with Phil Ivey. That would be amazing. Or you know, any, any, like any good poker pro, anyone who you like and respect, how cool would it be just to be able to interact with them? Because back when I started, you couldn't interact with anyone. Twitter didn't exist. Didn't know anyone's email address. They didn't have training sites. You couldn't watch them on the internet every morning. And I want to give everyone the experience that I wish I had because, um, Coming up, I didn't, I didn't, you know, you didn't get to interact with anyone. Would you ever consider making a poker site? Not a, a site where you play on. <laughs> Certainly not going to do that. If you are in Brazil, though, check out Check Raise. We may be a little part of that. All right. Let's see. I seem very intelligent. I got you tricked. Let's see. <laughs> you said you saw me at Borgata and walked by me and I said hi and I said hi back. <laughs> Give more of an introduction than, hi, because I will say hi back. But say, hi, I like you on a little coffee. And I'll say, awesome, we'll talk about a little coffee. Whenever you go to introduce yourself to someone who you like, make sure they at least have an idea of where you are or where, where, where they know you from. Because otherwise, especially if they're like me and they put out lots and lots of content, it's just confusing. The more you study, the less intuitive you become. Do we have any advice? It's kind of a weird question. Um, perhaps you were trying to implement plays from people who have a very different strategy than yours and implementing very specific plays from other people who have a very different strategy than yours may not be ideal. Um, the idea that like I make good reads on people and then play accordingly is relevant and useful, but at the same time, you'd rather play a fundamentally sound strategy than adjust based on these intuitions. So. I don't know, I'll tell you to continue studying harder and realize you need to just, you need to play better. I mean, I don't know. And also this, this sounds like a question from someone who is not playing a ton of volume. Cause you say it's harder to book wins. Like booking wins doesn't even matter, right? Any new blogs close to coming out on johnflowpoker.com? Back, every single week I post a new blog post. Every single week on Monday, that's today. That means one came out at um, 8 a.m. this morning. Monday at 8 a.m., I come out with a brand new blog post every single Monday at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash blog. If you've not gone there, I have um, 28 pages of blogs. I don't know how many are on a page. I think 10 are on a page. Maybe five are on a page. Maybe six. I don't know what it is. Um, I have a blog that comes out every week, so I'm not, not sure why you're missing it. If you're on my email list, I send an email out about it every Wednesday or something like that. Oh, let's see. You're playing. You're in the big blind. 28 big blinds. I'm going to push it all in for five big blinds. Button calls. You had eights in the big blind. You push. Um, I'd probably just flat. and see a flop. Dealing with the learning curve takes a lot of time and patience. Yes, it does. All right. Did you see Matt Berkey on PCA? No, I didn't. I don't have time to watch poker like that. It would be nice. Am I making a poker gaming website? No. It doesn't seem like a good idea for um, someone based in America who's not leaving in America, not leaving America to make a poker site. Doesn't seem wise. Plus, I have lots of other stuff on my plate. Is there a style to implement rather than just waiting for good cards? Yes. Read Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Can you have a stable income from playing poker? Yes! Find a game you can beat and then play it. Where should you start? Can you beat any game at the moment? Find a game you can beat and play it over and over and over and over and over again until you have money. That's what I did. I started with $50 online and I found a game I could beat and I played it over and over and over again until I had 300000 Do you recommend a way to instantly play your A game? Understand the fundamentals so well to the point that you can't screw it up. If you don't understand how to play poker well, you're not going to ever play an A game because you're not good at poker. You need to understand very good fundamentally sound strategies to where you can't mess it up. 
we discussed tilt a few, ep a few a little coffees ago, and whenever you're on tilt, you revert back to whatever you actually know. When you see someone playing poorly when they're on tilt, it just means they don't know very much. It's not ingrained into them to the point that they can't mess up. But whenever you see good players, whenever awful things happen to good players and they're obviously annoyed, they still play fine, right? I mean, maybe they don't play like above the rim and have amazing spot on reads anymore, but at the same time, they're not going to start opening 7-4 suited under the gun, right? You meant new video blog projects. Um, I'm not going anywhere until May, most likely, so probably not. You love the PokerCoaching.com webinars. Good. Are your books available on audio? Absolutely. Go to JonathanLittlePoker.com slash free. Go to JonathanLittlePoker.com slash free, and you can get the audiobooks there. If you never signed up for Audible, you can get two of them for free. Maybe two of them. They maybe change that, actually. You used to be able to get two audiobooks for free on Audible. I think now it may be one. But anyway, go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash free. All of my books that don't have a ton of charts are available. And then even Mastering Small Stakes, Turn, whole, uh, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold that does have a ton of charts is available and you can download the um, download the charts. All right, you're already in the money. 15 big blinds. You move all in with King Jack suited from middle position. Uh, probably min raise is better. All right. I think that's going to be it for today. Doc just posted a link to the push fold chart. Yep, you can use it on your computer. It's not banned by any online sites. So you can use it while you're playing. So you're good to go. Again, though, go back, watch the beginning of this, a little coffee, to understand the limitations of charts. Charts are terrible. Mm, you can stop right there. Char charts are terrible. Actually, no, that's not true. Charts are a great starting point, but you have to understand how to adjust them. If you sit there and you just blindly follow a chart, you're just going to light your money on fire quickly, especially a chart that has to deal with tournaments, because in tournaments, there are payout implications. If you use a push-fold chart on the bubble or at a final table, you're giving it away. You're straight up giving it away. And the problem is a lot of people out there who profit off of making charts, they don't make this clear. They just want to sell you their chart. That's why I try to make it completely free. We're not selling you anything with that. We just want to help you all. And understand that you need to understand when to adjust and what is relevant. Make sure you read the instructions. If you download some chart and there's no instructions, well, that's probably a problem, right? So um, watch out for yourself. Most people aren't out there watching out for you, and they're out to profit off of you. That's really something that's become very clear to me in the poker, well, I guess, anytime, anytime there's an educational economy out there, a lot of people don't really care about you. I do care about you. I mean, I'm sure everyone says they care about you. I know I actually do. And a lot of people don't. And it's hard to tell the difference. It's hard to tell the difference. That's it. What a sad, depressing way to end this, huh? All right. That's going to be it for today. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great, great day. We'll be back on Wednesday. I think on Wednesday we're going to talk about how to play against maniacs, unless something else pops onto my radar. Seems like you all liked last episode about how to play against... What do we talk about? I forgot. I already forgot about what we talked about. It's how to play against someone. We're going to talk about how to play against maniacs. Is that what I already did? Oh, no. Last time was how to play against passive players. We're going to talk about how to play against maniacs um, next time. So we'll do that on Wednesday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. If you've missed this, you can watch the replay on YouTube. Make sure you like, subscribe, retweet, share, whatever you all do with this. Whatever the internet kids do, <laughs> that would be fantastic. I would appreciate it. We're up from eight viewers up to 8,000. Might as well go ahead and get it up to 80,000 now. All right, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. And I'll see you Wednesday.